Hi, I'm Duke with Illusion, and this is the Extinguisher Deer Call. We're really excited about this product. It's a, it's a, it's a, a deer call that will allow you to go from fawn to doe to buck with just a flick of a finger. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the technology behind the extinguisher. Uh, the slide, which we call the modest slide technology, is actually moving an O-ring up and down the reed. And you just simply slide the slide up and down where you want it and it'll change the tone. And no matter where you have the, the modest slide set, whether it's at fawn, doe, or buck, it's gonna sound like a deer. So no matter where it's set, the call is always gonna sound like a deer. But uh, that's one of the great things about the modest slide. Now, another thing about the modest slide is, you know when it's cold outside and you hit that certain dew point, and when you're talking or breathing, you can see that moisture or steam come out. Uh, it's your breath that's condensing in the air. And what happens in those conditions is moisture will build up inside of your call. And in many cases, it's very cold out and it's actually uh, below the freezing point. So that moisture that's coming out of your breath will load up in your call. It can either make it stick or it can either make it freeze. Now, when that happens to you or if that happens to you, all you have to do with the extinguisher is run that modest slide up and down a couple of times before you call and it'll actually break the reed loose. It'll break it off of that tone board so it's not stuck and it'll sound just like a deer right away. So remember that, if you're seeing uh, moisture coming out of your breath, use that modest slide to your advantage. If it's, if it's sticking or freezing, and just run it up and down before you uh, blow into it and you'll get those sounds right out of the gate and it'll sound real good for you. Um, another thing about the extinguisher deer call I wanna go over is how to actually, how it functions, okay? Now the call is set up and it's designed to have the real natural tones of a deer and the natural volumes of a deer. If you can just imagine, um, if you're deer calling or if I'm yelling into uh, a, a conversation, you're gonna get on the defensive. And if your deer calling is too loud, you can really spark the um, fear into a deer or put them in a defensive mode. Um, how do you know when you're doing that? Well, if you call out a deer and you notice that they're uh, not necessarily coming your way or don't look at you, it doesn't mean they don't hear you. Um, Rod will talk about that as we get into our instructional on how you can tell how you're communicating with deer by their reactions. So the key is to have a wide range of volume and a wide range of tone and sound natural like a deer, especially from that 100 yards in. So let's get started on, on the function of the call and how to make it work properly. Now, the first thing you wanna do is just simply uh, place it between your thumb and, and your hand and wrap your hand around it. And the other thing is you just put it on your lip. I rest it on my bottom lip. And it takes very little air pressure to get this thing going. You don't actually blow hard into it. Uh, you just simply breathe into it and just make a nice little sound. Now it's really even air pressure. I'm just breathing into the call, kind of saying, ha. I'm not making any noise, voice or anything. I'm just easing the air through the call. So once the call is actually working and that reed is vibrating up and down, the next thing you want to do is chamber it so it sounds to the pitch that you want. Now you can fluctuate the, the sound of each note by using your hand. What I like to do is hang my end finger off the end of the call and I, that's what we call choking it off. And then I take another hand, a baffle hand, and I'll put it out in front so I can have more variation and more control over the pitch of my call. Now, the harder the air goes through, the little bit higher and louder the pitch. The slower and more even the air goes through, the more snap and coarse and lower the pitch. Let me give you an example here. I have the modest slide set all the way down to the buck position, and I'll slowly breathe in and have a nice deep chamber and choke it off a little bit. Now, did you notice at the end of that note when I lifted my hand off and opened up that pinky finger a little bit, it got to be a little bit of a higher pitch. So I got a tone variation with that note with a nice even air pressure. Now, if I wanna be more aggressive, I can add a little bit more air, pick up the volume. I just added air pressure to it. So air pressure control, will make a difference on how your note sounds. 
And that works the same way whether we're doing a buck sound or up to a doe sound. It changes the tone as you open up to a fawn. You notice that that changed as well. So keep that in mind that you're changing your tones with your hand if that's something that you want to do. Now, another thing that we can talk about is getting the different pitches in the, in the actual vocabulary out of the, uh, uh, the call itself and what it takes to communicate with a deer. And Rod White, Olympic gold medalist, Rod shot thousands of inches of Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett and one of the best deer communicators I've ever met. And the guy's simply amazing. So let's go to Rod and let's learn how to actually communicate with deer using the extinguisher deer calling system. There are a lot of different communications that deer use throughout the entire season. The ones we're focused on, for the most part, obviously are the ones whenever we're up in the tree and we're hunting throughout the season. In the early part of the season, when you hear does bleat, it's generally more of a, almost an assembly call, I guess you'd call it. Um, as the does are coming into the food plot, sometimes they'll use this just to signify that there's a, um, all clear and all safe in the food plot. And you'll just hear some soft bleats just like this. <coughs> They're kind of moderate in length, not real drawn out. Um, and you also hear some of the fawns communicate back if they haven't come into the food plot yet and they're trying to locate mom. You'll hear fawns throughout the entire season actually make a, a more long drawn out one. And uh, I'm gonna move it on up to the fawn section of the call. You may hear them do that two or three times until they catch up with the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the family unit. As you progress into um, the pre-rut stages, those vocalizations, those does are going to be making, um, will pertain not just to the bucks um, from a breeding purpose, but also they're going to begin to kick out the fawns. And as they begin to kick out those fawns, they'll become more grunts, almost of frustration. They'll be shorter, they'll be a little more pronounced, and they'll sound a little more like this. They're just a little bit more aggressive. They're basically trying to push their does off. Um, that will attract bucks uh, at, at coming into that time of year too, especially the younger bucks that are more immature. They're going to start cruising for does and they're going to be attracted to that. As, the season, as, as that rut progresses and gets uh, closer into the rut, where, or as that rut progresses and gets closer and closer into the actual breeding phase, you'll start to hear those does uh, actually make longer, a little bit more drawn out sounds and they'll sound a little more like this as they're being pursued by bucks. <laughs> Subtle, subtle differences. And then again, as you come into the late season, after the does have been bred, you're gonna hear those does uh, begin to work back in their family units again, and they're gonna start communicating with them as they did on a normal basis. And they're gonna shorten up their doe, uh, their doe bleeds just a little bit, and you'll hear it sound a lot more like this. Again, just kind of an all clear sound that you're gonna hear, uh, especially once a, a lead doe comes into a food plot, and she's bringing the rest of the fawns in with her. It just makes them feel a lot safer in the food plot. I want to go over a few things when it comes to calling in does, uh, sounding like fawns, those types of situations, and, and when you might want to use that. Uh, one thing that I found out when I was studying the actual deer, I was up in my deer stand, and I would see the fawn, especially early season bow hunting, this fawn and the does are still together. The fawn would have two basic bleats that they would always do. And the first one was basically what I would call a locator bleat, and it would let its mom know where it was. Imagine the, the, the doe or the mother is in the woods, you know, walking around and, you know, making sure things are safe and stuff before it comes out in the open. But the little kid comes running out and is jumping around and just seeing what's going on. So those two kind of have to communicate um, to make sure that, you know, the fawn wants to know where its mom is and, and, and vice versa. The, the mother wants to keep an eye on, on its uh, fawn. So the first bleed I'm going to talk about is a fawn bleed is a locator bleed. It's just a very simple short little bleed and you put very little air in. It sounds like this. Um. Very short, starts out at a high pitch and goes low. Ow. Um. Um. And all I'm doing is closing my hand down to end it in a low note. Now the reason I do it that way is because when the fawn bleats, it goes Meh, with the mouth open and as it closes its mouth, it makes the pitch go down a little bit lower. Now that's just the fawn walking around saying, hey, I'm, I'm over here, don't worry about it, and it still keeps playing and, and messing around. Now if the fawn gets um, 
it, a little bit distressed or, or stressed out or in fear of something, it will do more of a distress bleat. And that's a drawn out bleat where it actually opens its mouth and yells like, Mom, where are you? And it sounds like this. So it's more of a cry that goes out at a higher pitch. So I open that hand up and go, Mom, where are you? Okay, so those are two basic notes that the, the bleats that the fawn will do. Well, you say, well, I don't shoot fawns. I don't call fawns in. Well, that's fine. But what you can do is you can bring that doe in, and I will consistently bring does in early season when they're still running with their fawns. Um, you know, it, I, I would venture to say 50 to 60% of the does that are with fawns, I can bring them in right underneath the tree stand. And let me give you the scenario that I'll go, that I'll use for that. Um, imagine I see a doe come out in the middle of the open. What I'll do is I'll take that call and I'll hit a, I'll hit a little fawn bleat, just like a, just like that. And she'll pop her head up and she'll look around. But what I'll never do is call when she's looking at me. So I'll hit her with that little locator bleat, catch her attention, won't move, won't say nothing, let her get back to feeding. Boom, I'll hit her again. She'll pop her head up most of the time. Like, well, where's that coming from? Well, eventually those parental instincts are going to kick in. Um, the other thing I remember to do is to always point my call, not directly at the deer when I'm calling at it. I want to make sure that that's coming from a direction where she thinks, you know, I, well, maybe she can't quite see that area. So now I got her curiosity up. Maybe she's in the open, I'm in the timber. So I'll point the sound exactly where I want her to look and then she'll come walking to that area. Um, the other thing you can keep in mind is if she starts to work your way or doesn't start to work your way, and this is a slow, gradual process. She'll pop that head up, she'll start working your way, and eventually she'll just, the curiosity will get the best of her. She'll come in and take a look. But don't be afraid to add a little bit of a distress bleed in there, like a mirror, like, Mom, where'd you go? And a lot of times that'll really create that parental instinct, and that doe will come walking right in, right underneath your stand. And in a lot of cases, if she's with a fawn, the fawn will come in with her. So those are some great tips uh, to use to your advantage for calling in does if you're looking to harvest a doe. The most common uh, vocalization you're going to hear from a buck perspective is just a simple contact grunt. It's usually how I start out in almost every calling sequence whenever I am working with a live deer that's in front of me for sure. Um, and the reason I, I do this call is I like to refer to it as a contact grunt. All it is is simply an identification uh, noise or vocalization that, you're, that one buck will make um, as he's entering into a new area or he'll make to another buck really to identify him um, as, as a, a particular deer within that pecking order. And all it is is just a simple, um, it could be slid up, up higher into the buck range where you're getting close to the doe range. It could be slid way down deep if you're trying to imitate a more mature buck. But in general, I'm trying to match that vocalization with the age of that deer. So um, let's just take a, a, a two and a half or a three and a half year old buck, for example, that I want to make that sound. I'm going to slide it about mid range on the call and I'm just going to hit it just real simple, a real quick burst of air. It sounds like this. And that's all there is to it. A real simple grunt. Um, it's non-aggressive. Uh, it means nothing more than, um, hey, I'm a deer that's in the area. The strategy behind using a contact grunt is simply um, when I'm not sure what mood a deer is in or, or depending on the time of the year, I'm going to hit that contact grunt just to see what kind of reaction I get out of a deer. If I see a deer's ear stop, uh, a deer stop and sees ears swivel towards me, I know I've got his attention with a contact grunt. And from there I can discern whether he's going to become uh, a more dominant buck and try to approach me or whether he just wants to identify what age structure I might be. That's where you'll get into the more advanced types of calling where you'll get into longer, deeper grunts and try to imitate different age class uh, deer depending on what type of deer you're hunting, what age class deer you're hunting in your area. The next vocalization you're likely to encounter as we get closer to the rut is a buck trailing a doe or a buck that's seeking out a doe. And they may or may not be directly behind the doe when they're doing this. A doe may have came through um, moments before you got there and before you came into your stand and this muck, buck may be just a little bit behind her on her trail. And all you'll hear is it's a, it's a simple short burst of grunts, sounds like this. You usually hear them in a series of three or four, sometimes more, um, but typically around three or four grunts somewhere in there. 
The other time you'll hear that is whenever a buck is on a doe and they're chasing through the timber. That'll sound a little bit deeper and what's actually happening isn't a change in their vocalization. They're running and just like you whenever you run and make a vocalization or you try to talk after you're, you're, you're running or you're jumping, there's a little bit of air that's being forced into their lungs as they're making that sound and that vocalization is going to appear a little bit louder, a little bit deeper, it's going to sound more like this. <laughs> And it'll probably be a, a, a little more, um, uh, the cadence will actually get a little bit closer, but that's typically whenever a buck's following a doe um, and isn't in pursuit of a doe. Now the most common time I'm gonna use a trailing grunt is typically whenever I've got a buck that's just out cruising around. I wanna make him think that I've got a doe that's already come through and I've got a buck that's hot on a trail of a hot doe. So that's for the most part whenever I use that, whenever I know that a buck is actively seeking uh, a doe. And the way you'll know that is they're moving at a pretty quick pace and they're cutting a lot of trails sideways across instead of walking the trails lengthwise. Um, they're usually, look, they look like they're on a mission and they're gonna be cutting as many trails as possible those are the ones that, that I know are really, really susceptible to that, uh, to that type of a grunt. You'll hear a lot of terminology where folks will talk about in seminars and on, on uh, videos about different types of um, grunts that, that they'll refer to as a tending grunt. Um, in my opinion, from what I've seen, there's really not much difference between what I would call a tending grunt and a breeding grunt. And you don't hear a whole lot about a breeding grunt but a tending grunt is typically a, a, a grunt that a younger buck will make as he's, as he's trailing a doe. A breeding grunt is a long, drawn out, very deep grunt. It's usually made by more mature deer. Um, in, in my personal opinion, I think they're both one and the same. You're just looking at two different levels of age maturity, and that's why you hear a little bit of a difference in sound. But uh, generally, a, a, a real deep, a five, six-year-old buck is going to make that grunt, and it's going to sound out, it's going to be long and drawn out, and it can last up to seven, eight seconds. It's going to sound a lot like this. You're breathing a lot slower into the grunt, and the reason you're doing that is it's gonna it's gonna start to actually make some clicking sounds within the grunt itself. Um, the tending grunt, or what folks are calling the tending grunt, I think are more is more of a, a, a younger deer um, doing the exact same type of grunt. It just sounds a little bit a little bit lighter. Um, so you'll just slide it up a little bit if you're dealing with a deer that may be two and a half and three and a half. You're still going to make it kind of drawn out, but maybe not as long either. It's going to last three to four seconds, and it'll sound like this. You can tell the difference. Again, a long breeding grunt from a mature deer. And a younger deer that's probably two and a half and three and a half. Very, very subtle differences, but the tone um, is what really clarifies the difference in age structure. The difference in when I would use one call over the other call when it comes to a, 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 what folks call a tending grunt and, and what I call a breeding grunt is whenever I'm dealing with deer that I know are of age structure five and a half, six and a half years old, it seems like the younger deer that are two and a half and three and a half don't tend to come to those grunt calls as much. Um, maybe it's because they, they haven't let yet learned what that vocalization means, especially if you're hunting in some portions of, of the Midwest or out east where you don't have deer of that age class structure or deer that, that have the real deep, deep, deep tones to their grunts. So if you are hunting in an area where you have um, deer that are mainly two and a half, three and a half, maybe even one and a half, you're gonna wanna tend to use that, that, uh, uh, that, that what they call a tending grunt or what we've just described as a tending grunt. And if you're hunting here in the Midwest, in Iowa, Kansas, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and you're hunting deer that, are, that you know are around that are five and a half, six and a half years old, that's when you're really gonna wanna focus on using that real deep breeding grunt. That deep breeding grunt I'll use um, at two different times. One, I'll do it in essentially what, what folks will refer to as a blind calling sequence. Um, I may do a, a, a long drawn out doe call and then do a long drawn out breeding call. Um, 
just when we're sitting around, we don't have much action going on because you never know when there's a deer in the next draw. Um, the other instance where I'll use uh, a real deep call is whenever I watch a buck following a doe. I have pulled five and a half year old bucks off of does using that long drawn out call, but for the most part, you've got to convince them that you've got a hot doe and estrus with you. So you're gonna wanna make a combination of that, that estrus doe bleat and those long deep drawn out grunts in order to get them to uh, actually respond to you and come and leave her and come directly to your tree. It's rare, but you can pull it off. One thing you're going to want to keep in mind too whenever you're making these different types of calls is, and just to clarify, uh, the age structure of the deer here in the Midwest, obviously, when our deer get to, to five and a half, six and a half years old, you're looking at deer that are 280 plus, found, 280 plus pounds field dressed. When you get on the East Coast or you get down to Texas or you get in other areas of the country where deer aren't as big, those sounds obviously aren't going to be as deep either. So um, when you hear me say and relate a lot of this calling uh, techniques to upper age class deer, I am referring to the age class of deer, but um, also too to the, to the size of the deer. Remember small deer make, make uh, a little bit higher pitch frequency noises where a big, great big buck that's going to weigh 280, 290 or, plus, or above that, um, especially when you get up in areas of Saskatchewan, those are going to be even deeper yet. Another sound you're going to hear uh, quite frequently referred to as roaring um, or as growling. Those sounds, in my opinion, are typically made whenever deer is, is either extremely upset or it's in distress. You'll hear them for the most part whenever there are big fights going on where there's multiple bucks involved um, or they're in some other type of stressed out environment. And uh, you will hear it on occasion whenever a, a, an older, more mature buck is following a doe. So they certainly have their place. I myself personally don't use it a lot, but you can use it in a blind calling sequence from time to time. Remember, the more deer there are, the more eyes you have around you. And you may be working a buck thinking you're all alone. And, and before you know it, you've got a doe right below your stand that's got you nailed. So you have to be very, very cautious when you're using your calling sequences. And when you're attempting to communicate, try to keep communicate whenever your deer numbers are real low around you and not whenever there's massive numbers of deer around you. Now, to make the roar sound, all you're really doing is you're blowing through your call in the buck position. So you're adding a lot of heavy air pressure on it and you're just kind of doing a roar. And, and you do build your air pressure up, you'll start to hear the grunt go into like a growly sound and then you just end it with a, a, a burst and use your hand um, to make that sound as well. And it sounds like this. You'll notice how when I hit that hard burst at the end, I open my hand, you'll get that roar. And you know, that's a sound of distress. And here's an example, uh, we were at a, a deer farm where they were uh, actually inoculating some of the deer and, and taking their sheds off, you know, for their own safety. And you can hear this sound. And uh, you know, there's different scenarios when you can use it in cold calling and whatnot. I've personally seen it, uh, a deer do it when it was trying to charge a doe that was in estrus and trying to get her up and moving so that he could breed her. He would charge and do that little roar. And uh, the other place is I've used it in cold calling where I sounded like a doe that was in estrus with a little buck in the area. And then I sounded like a bigger buck pushing off that, uh, you know, creating this commotion of a bunch of deer. And uh, after a long breeding grunt, I did this roar. And I had a nice, about a 135 uh, Pope and Young come flying into us on that. So it can be effective. It, it is very loud. It's a very aggressive sound. And you will push deer away if you overuse this or um, you know, just be careful with it is all I can really say. From time to time, you'll hear a clicking sound in the woods if you're really paying attention. And that is almost always exclusively used whenever a buck is following a doe. In fact, I don't believe I've ever heard it with, w without a buck following a doe when they are ready to breed. And uh, it's similar to if, if you're an elk hunter out there, you've heard of the glunk before. It's very, very similar to that. It sounds just like this. And all I'm doing is simply flicking my tongue. You'll also hear that um, whenever a buck is becoming frustrated with a doe that's not quite ready to be bred, but is very, very close in that cycle. And it'll, it, you'll hear that clicking lead up into a long, drawn out breeding grunt, and you'll hear it sound like this. Uh, 
That's just a, a buck that's in frustration following a doe that's in estrus. Now I'm gonna break down making the pops or the click sounds. And all I'm gonna do is I wanna get a, a good little bit of volume in there, but it's just a very, the shortest, tiniest burst of air that you can put into the call. And the, the best way to do that is to use your tongue and just do like a T or a tick sound. So you're going tick, 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 tick. And that's what I'm doing. And the shorter and the sharper, the better the pop or click. And this is how it goes. You'll notice my jaws popping down. I'm using my tongue. I'm just going duh, 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 duh. and you can run the cadence whatever way uh, that best fits your your calling needs. But that's how you do the pops and the click sounds. A snort wheeze is a call that that we'll use a lot of times once we've brought in a deer using a rattling antlers, especially with rattling antlers and also whenever we're using um, some of the more aggressive type calls for the upper age class deer. And a snort wheeze for, for us, we just do actually typically with our voice and it's just a, uh, a blowing real quick out of the air, uh, pushing out air out through your teeth. And it sounds a lot like this. Now, snort wheeze call is, is something that, it's another buck telling another buck that he's there and be aware of me. It's an aggressive sound. Um, if you have a, a less dominant buck, it might get him out of there, but a lot of times what it'll do is it'll create that instinct, you know, of well, who's over there, you know, especially if that's his territory. And this is a great example of, of how it can work for you, uh, where we did a little snort wheeze out in the woods and just watch the reaction to this deer right here. <laughs> Now this next sequence of calling is just gonna blow your mind and, and it, it'll really show you how important it is to understand how to communicate. And r like I said before, Rod is one of the best at understanding how the deer's behavior and how to communicate with big whitetail. Let's go take a look at this hunt. On this hunt, we were hunting in some really heavy cover, which is where most of the vocalization communication occurs on, on a lot of the farms that we hunt. This buck was following a hot doe across a ridge in some really heavy cover whenever we identified him as a potential shooter. The first couple grunts that I gave this buck was strictly what I call contact grunts. It was only to let him know that I was another buck that was in the area that had the potential for following his doe as well. Those first few contact grunts did more than just acknowledge to him that there was another deer in the area. It actually angered him, possibly because the doe that he was following was either not quite receptive or there may have been multiple does in the area that were receptive. The easiest way to identify that anger is by looking at the hair on his back. When you see the shadowing start to occur along the length of the back, that indicates the hair is raising up on his back and you'll see his ears start to pin back towards the back of his body. To play off his frustrations, in the next series of calls I did, I threw in a snort weed. This was to show that I had aggression towards him. This is where the questioning process, in his mind at least, will begin to where he thinks maybe this isn't just a buck following a doe, this may be a more dominant buck that either came in from another farm or a, or a more aggressive buck that he's tangled with earlier in the season.
Adding a doe bleat will only add to the realism that there's a, a very strong possibility that there is a buck tending a doe just over the hill or out of sight of that deer. Again, this is where heavy cover really makes it beneficial to be, to be carrying a grub call with you. The next series of grunts that you'll hear me do are long drawn out breeding grunts. These are sounds that are typically only made whenever a buck is following a doe that is in heat and actually willing to breed. I'll use these grunts in very specific areas like breeding rooms or in heavy cover like we're sitting in today. When you see deer start to use behavior like rubbing trees or making scrapes, those are sure signs that you're communicating with that deer and he's beginning to understand that you are definitely another deer in the area and he's made a commitment that he's going to show some kind of dominance to you. In most cases, he's usually committed to coming to your stand, but that isn't always the case. One behavior you're really gonna to wanna to be aware of whenever you're in a heavy calling sequence like this is to watch his lips to see if he's actually licking them with his tongue. This isn't for any other reason other than to add moisture to his nose which will help him identify which deer you may be in his social structure. If you ever have any doubt that the buck may be going to be skirting to get downwind of you, one of the things you can do is get more aggressive again with a snort wheeze. This communication will serve the purpose that even though you're focused on breeding a doe, you now recognize that he is also in your area and you're going to become aggressive towards him to defend your right to breed that doe. Once you see behavior like the scraping and the rubbing activity, you can move into the breeding grunts. Those long breeding grunts are going to simulate that I am actually not just in fact a deer that's over the hill or, or an aggressive deer that's over the hill that may be of a similar age structure, but most importantly that I am breeding a doe or in the process of breeding the doe right now. And that's something that most mature bucks simply can't resist. Another sound that's very effective once a buck is within close range is to make a series of short, fast grunts. This simulates a buck that is following a doe but is actually running after her. It's simply the deer's weight, body weight hitting the ground as he's running following the doe. Again, the continual licking of the nose indicates that he's still trying to identify what buck may be just over the hill that's out of sight from him. It was our silhouettes against the skyline that caught him off guard. You'll see his behavior switch almost instantly after he looks in the tree as he decides it's time for him to leave. Since he hasn't identified the buck, he's convinced that he's either not there or he's been duped before by, by another hunter. It was at this point we decided that with all the great footage that we had so far, we couldn't let this deer walk out of our lives. Understanding how to effectively communicate with deer in a variety of environments is really the key to consistent success, especially during the months of late October and into early November.
Now we're gonna head out to the field and show you how important the modest light can be when it comes to hunting. Rod's out hunting this buck and he has a great experience. Let's go take a look at this footage. You know, literally for me, I'm using a call almost on a daily basis and communicating with deer regardless of the phase of the rut. So it's very important to identify right away or as quickly as possible what type of mood or temperament that deer's in. In this example, it's only one of dozens that we encounter uh, throughout the season, literally. This buck walks into a field and I hit him with a couple contact grunts, which is typically how I start any of my calling sequences. Once I hit him with a couple of those grunts and I, and I can start to perceive that really he's, it, it's obvious he's been on the run most of the day chasing does. He's probably been around several other bucks. It's a little bit later in the season and more than likely there's multiple bucks on one doe that he's been dealing with throughout the entire day. So when I was grunting towards him, um, and after I could acknowledge that he actually heard the grunts, I could tell that he obviously, uh, he's been messing with a bunch of other bucks throughout the day. So I shifted my grunts to a breeding grunt, which signified that I was actually a buck breeding a doe. And he stopped just for a second, someone acknowledged me and moved on again. So the next call that I, that I hit was I just slid the modest slide down and, and made a, an actual a doe call or a, a bleat. It was clearly all that he needed to know that there was definitely a doe down over the hill that was being bred and that's what drew him directly to the stand and it's obvious uh, you can tell exactly when that call's hit when it hits his eardrums he knows instantly that that's the time to come on over and check out to look for the girlfriend he's been after all day. Even though this is one of dozens of scenarios that played out for us uh, that fall and each and every day during the hunting season, it shows how critically important it is to be able to slide that modest slide and imitate different genders as well as different age structures of deer that you're trying to communicate with. You know, I know how effective it can be when it comes to calling and communicating with deer and that's why I created the Extinguisher Deer Calling System. But there's another way that you can bring deer in along with your calling and that's through rattling. And we're gonna see how effective rattling can be in the field using a new rattling system called the Black Rack along with the extinguisher calling system. Let's go take a look. Opportunities like this are great ways to learn a little bit more about communication with mature whitetails. This footage is of a deer that quickly responded to some blind rattling calling that we made just previous to him showing up below the ridge. Once he came over the ridge, I gave him a couple contact grunts just to let him know exactly where I was at. I already had in my mind that I was going to make this a learning experience with this deer. One mistake I made this afternoon, and which was a big learning experience for me, was after he walked on by my tree, I grunted at him again and he immediately showed a response to that grunt. When I rattled the second time, he came back in my direction and circled my tree again. This should have been an indication for me to be a little bit more on my toes, but I was having too much fun. I tried him once or twice more with grunts, and he didn't pay much attention. It could have been possible because it was extremely windy that day. So when I hit the rack again, it invoked an immediate response and sent him back under my tree again. But this time, once he passed my tree, he kept on moving.
when I got more aggressive with the antlers and he moved off, that was the signal I should have recognized right away to pick up my bow because there was another buck he was with. During this time of year, if you have a buck react over and over and over again to calling sequences of any kind, whether you're using a grunt or a rattling antler set, especially with a rattling antler set, you should really be on your toes because it's more than likely he's traveling with another buck. That was exactly the case this day. By the time he popped up the ridge, it was just too late. We barely got the camera on him and I certainly couldn't turn his attention back towards the tree. He'd already made up his mind that that buck had moved off and he was off the ridge too. Experiences with mature deer like this are great opportunities to learn more about communication. Unfortunately, on this day, I learned one extra lesson I really didn't count on.